Welcome to Corn Con 9, day two. So I just wanted to give a, a quick little talk. This is what I call the Pied Piper. So it's, you know, how can I uh, use a little Python to have some fun with NTFS deleted files? Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about NTFS and how kind of it works, how do deleted files work at NTFS, and kind of go from there, um, and just kind of show you some simple stuff that you can do. So first of all, in NTFS, files and directories are all just a collection of attributes. Right? So an attribute is something about a file. Now, in NTFS, the data in the file is itself an attribute. It's the dollar sign data or dollar sign 80 attribute. And every file is going to have certain attributes. So every file or directory is going to have something called standard info. It's also dollar sign 10. That's the numerical ID is 10 hex um, for standard info. And it's also going to have at least one file name. They might have more than one file name, depending on the situation, but that's kind of how that works. So these attributes are all stored in this thing called a master file table, or MFT. So it's kind of like the central thing in NTFS, and it's literally in the middle of the file system. They put it there for performance reasons. That way, you know, you're not constantly going from one extreme of the drive or partition to the other if you have a physical hard drive and it just enhances performance. Right. So uh, MFT and attribute. So MFT entries are all 1K bytes or two sectors long. And each of these MFT entries contains a header and then it contains a list of attributes for the file or directory. So each attribute itself, in turn, contains a header. And then there is the data stream. And the data stream is either resident, it's inside the MFT, or if it's too large to fit in that MFT entry, it becomes non-resident, which basically means it gets kicked out into the data clusters. So here's a little screenshot, I think it's somewhat legible, um, just kind of showing you the MFT header. I am using a tool called ActiveAct Disk Editor. It's by LSoft. It is a free tool. It is available for Windows and Linux. Uh, if you go to disk-editor.org, you can download this tool for free. It's a great tool. I use it in multiple classes at the university where I teach. I, I didn't really intro myself very well, but uh, my name's Phil Polster, by the way. I work at Bloomsburg University. I teach in our digital forensics and cybersecurity degree program over there. Um, and by the way, the Piper hat was just kind of an accident. I realized my talk was called the Pied Piper, and I just happened to be wearing this Piper aircraft hat. It's a gray hat, so I'm, I, I guess this is a gray hat talk uh, today, but anyway. So one thing that's nice about this tool is that it has templates for all these different file system items, so it will show you, you know, kind of what's going on here. So let me just kind of step over here for a second and play Vanna. Um, so here you can see I've got an NTFS showing me, all right, it starts with this file in ASCII that just says, hey, we didn't screw up. Um, then it has an offset to something called an update sequence. If you look at the bottom of each sector, the end of each sector, it's going to have a certain number in the last two bytes. And so the update sequence is basically just what should you find there, what should have been there. 
then this update sequence size, it's always going to be three. There's one entry for what should be there, and there's two entries, one for each sector on what would have been there before. Then we have something called a log file sequence. That is a reference to this file or directory in the journal, which they refer to as the log. So if you don't know what the journal is, the journal is used to enhance robustness and performance. It allows you to uh, make a change but not write it to the disk right away. So that enhances performance. And there's also some sort of a transactional system, if you will. So if you have your computer lose power, when it comes back and it says, hey, this isn't shut down cleanly, it's going to the journal entry and it's making stuff up. So it makes it a little bit more robust. And then after that, we have something called a sequence number. The sequence number is nothing more than how many times has this entry been used. Whenever we refer to an MFT entry, we always refer to it by the entry number and that sequence number. That way, if there's something that went wrong and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, you referred to MFT entry 42, sequence number two, and when I looked in that entry, I saw sequence number three, right? And that's bad, right? Um, then we have something called a hard link count. How many names do you have? In this case, this one has one name. And then we have the offset to the start of our actual data here. Um, and then we have some flags. And these flags are actually going to become relevant here in a little bit. Those flags are right here. And bit 0, which has value 1, says this thing is in use. This entry is being used. And bit 2 which has a value, I'm sorry, bit one, which has a value two, tells you, is this a directory? So if it's a directory that's stored there and it's in use, you will see that it has a value of three. If it's a file, it'll have a value of one. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but what happens when you delete a file is mostly, in the case of the MFT entries, it just changes that in use flag to say, no, we're not using this spot anymore. But it doesn't otherwise destroy any database. Right? In the case of fat files, um, it can be really hard sometimes to get those files back. But that's not true in this case. Then we have the real size of the entry. You know, How much of this entry is actually being used? We had one K. And then what's the size? 1K. Uh, base file record, occasionally you get into a situation where there are too many attributes to store in one, app, one entry. And this will be a continuation of another entry. And that's just a reference to that. You know, usually it's not. Uh, and you know, what's the ID of this record? 2313. That's the MFT entry number, and then there's some other information. Right? So that's the header. Right? So that's how this thing is going to start out. Now, after that, as I said, you know, you delete a file, we just flip that flag. And we say, hey, it's not in use anymore. Uh, there's something else in NTFS. I don't know how many of you are familiar with FAT and how it works, but you know you have the FAT table, file allocation table. That's where they get their name from. And um, then you have an entry for every cluster that says, hey, this cluster's free. This cluster, it's something that's stored here is continued into another cluster, or uh, whatever's stored here ends here. Right? Those are the three values you can get for that. Well, NTFS doesn't do that. NTFS has a big bitmap for every cluster on that file system. And if there's a one in that appropriate bit, it says, okay, this cluster is being used. So you delete a file, 
it says the entry is not in use, goes to the bitmap, says these clusters are available. And you know, if there's some directory entries, those are removed as well. Right? But all of the important stuff that you need to get your files back remains unchanged. So that's the, the most important thing to know for what we're talking about today. Right? All right, so a little bit more about a couple of these items, these attributes. Uh, first one, standard info, dollar sign 10. Again, has a hex value of one zero or 16 in decimal. Um, it's always the first attribute because these are stored in numerical order. It's the lowest numbered attribute, so it's always going to be the first one. It is always going to be resident. It's never going to be out in a data cluster. I mean, this thing's not very large, and it's the very first thing. There's no reason why it would not be stored in the MFT directly. Right? It's always a fixed size because none of the fields in this thing have a varying size. Right? And what does it store? It stores primarily some timestamps, there's four of them, and some file attributes as well. And here's what it kind of looks like. Again, this is using ActiveAt, which is freely available, disk-editor.org, for those of it, you that missed it earlier. Um, it's available for Windows and Linux both, right? Okay. So here is my dollar sign 10 attribute. It starts with the attribute type. And again, every attribute has a header and then it has the data stream, the actual attribute. So I've got my standard header, attribute type, what's the length, including the header, is it resident or not? In this case, it's resident. Does it have a name? There are attributes that can be named, right? Uh, most of them are not. So th this one is never named. So its name length is zero. Again, this is all fixed length stuff, which makes our life easy, right? Um, and then any flags for it, its attribute ID happens to be zero. The length of the actual attribute in this case is 72. Um, and What's the offset to the start of this? There's an indexed flag. What's an indexed flag? What's an index? Well, if you do anything with like databases, you know, you put an index on a column that says, I want to be able to look this up really quick. Um, there's nothing in this that you would look up based on that with any regularity. So this is not indexed. Uh, file names are a different story. We'll see that those are normally indexed, right? And then we get into the standard attribute information in general, and that's kind of here in this expanded part, and it starts with these four timestamps. When was it created? When was it modified? When was the record changed? And when was it last accessed? Now, Microsoft, by the way, has a really strange way of storing this stuff because they store hundreds of nanoseconds since January 1st of 1601. You know, everyone else, 1970, right? Epoch. And then there's Microsoft, right? And if you look at FAT file systems, they use 1980. And here they're using 1601, because you know, we had so many files back then, so many computer files, we're just storing them on those NTFS file systems, but um, yeah, it's Microsoft for you. So we have those timestamps, uh, where our file permissions, and we have a couple of fields that we don't really use anymore, and that's, that's kind of it, right? So that's our standard info. Again, fixed size. Now, what's the next attribute? Next attribute, most of the time, is going to be a file name, dollar sign $30. Again, these are stored in numerical order. And there's occasionally going to be something called a dollar sign $20. It's an attribute list. So when we look at this simple little script in a little bit, you'll see there's a, a a 
basically a check that says, hey, was this dollar sign 20? If it is, just kind of skip over it. And you know, I kind of enhance the script by doing that. I enhance the script by saying, hey, if it had more than one file name and it's the short file name, uh, then I, I want the long file name, not, not the teeny tiny 8.3 file name, right? So if you looked at like the original script that was actually in, in my Windows Forensics book, it's not as good as the one I'm gonna talk about right now, right? Okay, so dollar sign 20 is pretty rare, but basically this happens when you have a file that's large and fragmented. So the way that they tell you where your file is stored in NTFS, assuming that it's large enough that it can't be stored right in the MFT itself, is to give you these things called data runs. It's essentially a list of clusters. It's like starting at this cluster and going for 27 clusters, this is where I wanna store this file. Right? So I could have a huge file with one single entry but if it starts getting fragmented and large, then I might run out of space in my 1K. And then now I have to use multiple MFT entries. And then this attribute 20 um, attribute list comes into play. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because this is you know, just a basic introduction. Uh, by the way, in our forensics degree program, we spent an entire semester mostly just talking about NTFS. So I'm trying to teach you the basics of NTFS here in a couple minutes uh, today. So just FYI, we're not gonna cover every single thing you could ever know about this. But. Okay, so in the world of FAT, if you had a long file name, that's actually handled in the directories. So inside the directories themselves, you will have a short file name entry that has all the metadata like file size, things like that. And then you will have one or more long file name entries that just store chunks of the file name in Unicode. But in NTFS, they just give it another file name. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a second. So what's in this file name attribute? Well, it has those same four timestamps it has a couple of attributes, the file size information, what's the size on disk, what's the actual size of the file, what's its name, the name is stored in Unicode, and it also contains something called a namespace. So the namespace can either be POSIX, it can be Win32, which basically means it's a long file name, or it can be DOS, it's like an 8.3 file name. You guys know what I mean by an 8.3 file name, right? It's eight characters, period, then an extension. Or it could be both DOS and Windows, right? Basically, it was short enough that its long file name complies with the 8.3. And that's what that means. Um, so here's my trivia question for the day. Post 6, does anybody know what POSIX is. You ever heard that word? All right, so POSIX stands for Portable Operating System X. The X was added to sound Unixy. So way back when, when people were writing Unix applications, they would write an application for HP Unix. And then if someone wanted to run it on Solaris, on their Sun machine, it's like, well, they have slightly different windowing systems and it's kind of a pain in the butt. And they said, well, let's make a standard. So a programmer can write to that standard and then not have to write it four or five times for different flavors of Unix. Because you know Unix isn't supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be compatible with everything. And that's where POSIX was born. And they, they literally added the X to make it sound Unixy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the good version of POS would be portable uh, uh, point of sale, but th there's other not so flattering uh, POSs, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, especially programmer types, right? You know where they're gonna go. Um, so yeah, um, the dollar sign 30, again, uh, here's an example. You can see it has the standard header, and then it goes through and it says, what's my parent directory? What's the MFT entry number for my parent? And of course, what is their sequence number? Because I need to know both of those things. So that if I go there to double check and I have sequence one here, and it suddenly was two, I know there's some data corruption. There's some inconsistencies there. Same four timestamps. What's my allocated size? What's my real size? If it's a directory, the size will be zero. This is a directory, that's why it's zero. Um, and then what are my attributes? And if you look at the attributes, you can also expand those. You'll see that this thing has an attribute. It has the attribute of, oh, by the way, I'm a directory, okay? And then finally, if it's a file, you know, we've got to talk about files sometime because that's sort of what this tile talk was about. Um, you're going to have a dollar sign 80. So your file starts out and it's small. That dollar sign 80, the data can be used completely inside of the MFT entry. If it's small and you're like, how small does it have to be, Phil? Um, it depends on things like does this file have multiple file names? Are they really long? Are there other attributes taking up space in the MFT? So it can vary, I'd say roughly between 300 and 700 bytes would be pretty typical, right? So small files completely in the MFT, larger files use data runs, and you know I kind of describe that, it's just like, Here's a chunk of clusters. Right? So it starts with this thing called a size byte, and it says how long is my cluster count in this data run? How long is my offset in this data run? So the first one is like starting at this cluster, this many, uh, starting at this cluster, this many clusters, and then after that, it's just an offset from the first value which is fun for my students at the university because it's often their first introduction to signed integers and you know dealing with signed integers on your computer right? and doing two's complements and, and fun stuff like that. But interesting story, I actually gave a test uh, Wednesday. I, I left to come here on Thursday intending to be here Thursday night but I, um, I flew with somebody else in, a, in their small plane. And I guess the problem was it wasn't a Piper, you know, it was something else. But we ended up getting stuck in Michigan Thursday night and waiting for the weather to get a little bit better. And then we flew in here yesterday morning instead. But. So here's the dollar sign 80. You can see this file actually has four data runs. Each data run starts with a size byte. See the first one is 3-1. That means that it's three bytes for the cluster offset and one for the count. Each of these data runs, it's probably hard to see from there, but they have one cluster, right? So this is a f definitely a fragmented file, right? Okay, now. In NTFS, we have some special files. They call them metadata files. They're some of the first entries in the MFT. The very first entry, entry number zero, is a file called dollar sign MFT. Guess what? It is a reference to the MFT itself. Right? So I usually like to actually extract the MFT as a file to operate it on that. Why do I do that? Uh, it makes things faster because I don't have to go looking for the MFT if I have an image file. And it also makes my life better if the MFT is fragmented. It's not often fragmented, but if you start running out of space uh, then you can get a fragmented MFT. 
and then that makes things much more complicated. So it's like, okay, we'll just skip it. We will grab that file and we know even if the thing is fragmented, it can't be fragmented at the very first cluster, right? It's like, oh, it's the very first entry. So I'll just grab that. Okay, so let me have a look here at the script. It's looking kind of small, isn't it? Let me improve on that. This is also not an ideal platform. It's like highly sloped and I'm trying to like type and stuff on it. All right, is that big enough? Okay, cool. So, you know, basic Python script. How many of you know Python in here? All right, cool, most of you. Um, so, of course, every proper script starts with this line, right? A shebang line. And why do you want to do that? You want to do that because you need to be able to tell the operating system, hey, run this. It's also some documentation. And every operating system in the world, except for Windows, of course, will read this line. Um, and this is a Python 3 script. Uh, if you look in the book, actually, I believe that script that this was based on was a Python 2 script. There was a couple reasons for that at the time, but they've since gone away. All right, so we have a couple of basic imports. We import sys and OS path. That's mostly so I can open a file and, or go, does this file exist before I open it? We have a library called struct. Struct is basically used for interpreting binary files. It's for interpreting C structures, but that's what we use it for in forensics. So I defined a couple of helper functions that use that library. Um, so here I've got, you know, get unsigned 32-bit integer, get 16-bit unsigned, 8-bit unsigned, 64-bit unsigned, and the weird one is 48-bit unsigned, right? There isn't such a thing, but they have 48-bit cluster numbers and MFT entry numbers in um, NTFS. I don't know why, that's just the way they do it. So, um, so you can see this is kind of like a little kludge where I add 0000 at the front of it to say, hey, just go ahead and change that. Little usage function, and this is kind of like the main guy here. It's called check for deleted. And I just say, hey, let's do a sanity check are those first four bytes file, you know, this ASCII string. By the way, one of the differences, how many of you have ever used Python 2 and 3? All right, just a couple of you. Most of you are like Python 3 only, right? So Python 3, every string by default is a Unicode string. In Python 2, it's an ASCII string. And when you start dealing with binary files, things get weird quick if you're not used to the differences. So, you know, Python 3 is intentionally not compatible always with Python 2. This is a great example where it's really not. And you have to be careful if you're used to Python 2 um, with this. So here I'm saying, is this bytes, that's what the little b means. And essentially, this is an ASCII string. It contains F-I-L-E. And then we check the flags. I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to look at this position, position 22 from the start of this thing. That has those flags. I'm going to say, is that value a 0 or a 2? If it's a zero, there's potentially a deleted file here. 
it is possible that there's nothing there, that this entry just hasn't been used yet. It was pre-filled, it was blank. Right? Or if it's two, then there used to be a directory here, but it was deleted. Then I do a double check. I say, all right, give me the MFT number. What's the entry number? Well, it better not be zero. And if it is, then we have a problem. Right? Now what? We're going to say, what kind of a thing are you? Right? Remember, at the beginning of every attribute, the first entry is four byte value that says, this is the kind of thing that I am. And if I look here, and this is actually the second attribute, because remember, dollar sign 10, standard info is always in the same place. So I knew exactly where to look. I'm looking at offset 152, right? So at that offset, I should have a type for the next attribute. And I'm hoping that it's dollar sign 30 or 30 hex, which is 48. If it's 32, then I'm going to actually look inside of it. And I'm going to look at the next thing, which comes right after it, four bytes later. And I'm going to say, oh, what is your offset? What is the total size of this attribute? And if that offset, if it's a dollar sign 20, I'm going to take that offset and I'm going to add it. I'm going to say, well, we'll just pretend like we never saw this, for our purposes at least. And then what? Then I'm going to check and say, is this, because now I'm definitely pointing at a dollar sign 30, right? I was probably at a dollar sign 30, but now I'm definitely there, because if there was a dollar sign 20, I skipped over it, right? And I'm going to look at this particular field, and I'm going to say, is it equal to 2? And you're like, well, what's that? We talked about those namespaces. This is the numerical value for the namespace that means, oh, guess what? I'm a DOS 8.3 file name. If I have a DOS 8.3 file name, I have to have a long file name. Which would you rather be displayed? The long file name. Right? It's going to be much more intelligible. So I'm going to just do the same story. I'm going to skip over that. Right. So now, in theory, I should be at a long file name. And I just do a quick check. I get the length of that file name. And if the length is more than zero, I am going to create a file name. And again, this is another one of those things that's weird with Python 3 that I have to take this byte stream, or actually it's technically not a byte stream, it's a bunch of bytes, and I have to convert that to a Unicode string. And I do that by saying this is string, and it's using UTF-16. UTF-16 is basically an uncompressed or unencoded Unicode string, right? Where if it's just ASCII, every other byte's zero, basically. And then I check the flags. If they're zero, then it was, in fact, a file. And if not, then I found a directory. Right. Do you guys follow me so far? It's pretty basic. Right. And then we have our main method. I take your file name, and I go, OK. Let me check, make sure it's a file. And you could possibly give me an offset. Like if you gave me, instead of giving me a MFT file, which is gonna make this quicker, you could give me a file system image file. Now there might be more than one partition on this thing. 
and you need to tell me which partition do you want? What's the starting sector for that thing? Okay. And I just read in this stuff, and again, if it's not an MFT file that you gave me, that's not required by this script, I'm just gonna scan forward one byte or one sector at a time until I have aligned, I've basically found the MFT. And then I'm gonna read that. And then it's just a basic little loop here. I open that file, read only binary, and then I seek ahead if I need. And then I read in the MFT in 4K chunks. And I process it. That's it. Pretty simple. Um, most of you have probably seen this little trick. If you haven't, this is what you can do to make your Python script run something, right? You don't have to explicitly run like a main method. You can just say if double underscore name, double underscore equal equals, and then the string double underscore main, double underscore. Then just run this. Has anyone never seen that before? Just curious. That's good. So that you've got good people that taught you Python, or maybe you taught yourself. So good job. Good job teaching yourself Python and learning that. Okay. So let's go ahead and actually use this stuff. So how do we do that? You can use FDisk or another program like you know, ActiveAt, Disk Editor, you get the starting sector, right? And then you can use another script, uh, which I have, it's called extract.py, and it says, hey, there's an MFT entry for a file or directory. Please extract it for me. By the way, here's something that's kind of cool. I didn't have to write a new script because this extract script works with files that are deleted and files that aren't. It just goes, okay, here's the clusters and let me put it together in a file. Right. So let me just show you how that's done real quick. Pull up a command prompt. I'll just kind of walk you through this and show you how it goes. So I'm gonna go to my corn con directory. I'm gonna run extract. My image is called Cybermen. Who are the Cybermen? Who's heard of the Cybermen before? Where are they from? Doctor Who. Doctor Who. They're the vict the villains in Doctor one of the villains in Doctor Who. Not the Daleks. They're the other big villains. But um, and what do Cybermen like to do? Delete stuff, people, basically. So that's that's the name for this image. That's why it's Cybermen, if you're just wondering. But okay, so this has an offset of 63, and I want to extract dollar MFT. And no, actually, I'm not going to give it dollar MFT. I haven't gotten it yet. Dash E, and I'm going to say zero. Entry zero. It says extracting file dollar MFT. So my extract script has something in there, and it says, hey, is there a dollar sign in this name? If there is, please substitute for the word dollar, right? Because in every good operating system, dollar sign is used for an environment variable. Then there's Windows that uses percent, and then variable name, percent, right? But every other OS in the world uses dollar signs. So dollar signs in your file names make things a little bit weird. Okay, so now what? Well, now I can go ahead and say, I want to run this little script we just looked at, and I want, let me just go ahead and enter it, to run it, and I want to get a list of potentially deleted files. Okay. I'm going to run it directly on $MFT. 
All right, now let me make this a bit bigger. I'll go ahead and pipe it to less. Okay, and that was it. Um, I found a couple of possibly deleted files. Let me not pipe that to less. You know, a couple of them like TMP, EDB, that's probably not all that interesting. But I do have some PDF files. I got a JPEG file, a doc file, um, a couple other things. Right? So now what can I do? Well, let's say I want to go ahead and undelete those files. It's pretty easy to do. Right? Like, let's say I'm going to pick this one, nothing to see here, ODT. I'm like, yeah, let me delete that. And I can cheat a little bit. I kind of scroll up here. I can rerun my extract script. Now this time, I'm going to give it dash M and give it my dollar MFT, because I bothered to do that. And we said nothing to see here was at 22,798. So let me just extract that one. 22,798. And extracted that file. Uh, I'll grab a couple others just for fun. Um, safe to run. Sounds interesting, right? Definitely safe to run. Why wouldn't it be called? If it's called safe to run, you know that it's safe, right? 22804. And I could grab maybe an office document, PDF. Uh, I got a couple of JPEGs. Let me grab a quick JPEG. I got one at 22, or GIF actually, 22799. Okay, so hopefully you would agree that was pretty easy, right? I looked at this image, I'm like, in a couple of seconds, I have a list of potential deleted files, and I could just go ahead and try to recover them, right? I, I did actually contemplate having a, like, a do everything script where it's just like, hey, just go have, have at it. And then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, it's, that's potentially problematic because then you worry about things like, oh, well, maybe you had a file with the exact same name in different directories and now I'm gonna overwrite stuff and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably better just to have two scripts. All right, so you know, why do I love Linux? There's a lot of reasons, but one reason that I love Linux so much is I can just you know, use all kinds of tools, right? You got Linux, it comes with thousands of tools. You can, you can take an image file like this and just mount it up and, and do all kinds of stuff with it. So it's really powerful and easy to use. But I can see here, here's my files. Here's my nothing to see file. I could even double click on that. And this one is telling me, okay, that was not a LibreOffice document. So I don't want to look at that one, but I can see that my other file, this little GIF file, yeah, I understand. You're unhappy with me. Um, that's, that's legit, right? It's a legit GIF file. And I can go and look at safe to run. Uh, I probably don't want to just run that, but I could inspect it with some sort of a hex editor, or I could you know, load it up in a debugger and do different stuff like that. Um, okay. So back to this. Um, that's, that's pretty much 
what I wanted to talk about. So does anyone have any questions about that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, now with NTFS, if it was really only one byte, it would probably be size on disk would be zero, right? Because it would be completely in the MFT itself. But yeah, I mean, if you want, real quick, I actually have this tool open. Um, if you look, I gotta click on the right thing. So here, if I look at the root directory, you'll see all those metadata files, including bitmap, and I can look into this file. I could actually extract this file if I wanted to, um, because it's MFT entry number six. Right. So I can say, all right, it's entry number six, and let me just extract it using my little script. But like if you look into it, let me just inspect the file record, you'll you'll see that this one has a dollar sign eighty. It's non resonant and it will likely have just a single data run. Right? And this thing goes on for eighty clusters. Starting here, if I click on this little hyperlink, it will bring up that file, right? So you can see that all of the early clusters are being used up until, you know, whatever this one represents at position one, zero, zero. You know, so you could do the math and go, oh, okay, those are some free clusters. And I can see if I, probably if I scroll down. I'll see some more free clusters and some more free clusters. Yeah, it will it will look at this bitmap um, and if you look at the well in the case of like a fat 32 file system, they actually have something in the in the boot sectors, it's called an FS info block, where it'll tell you how many free clusters you have and what was the last allocated one. And it uses that to try to guess where it's gonna find free space. But you know, since NTFS looks works differently, it just goes right to this bitmap and goes, hey, where's there some free spots? Things like that. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, it will just go out and my script doesn't actually check the bitmap. Again, it works with files that are deleted and files that aren't. So it's not actually gonna check the bitmap. It's just gonna go, oh, well, let me grab those clusters for you. And they might be garbage, right? If the clusters already got overwritten or partially overwritten, but it's just gonna grab those clusters. So when you delete a file in any Windows file system, it doesn't matter, they never go out to those clusters and overwrite stuff. It's always there until the cluster gets reused. So there's always a chance. All right, anyone else? Yeah. It's called ActiveAt Disk Editor. And if you go to disk, D-I-S-K-editor.org, you can download it and it's free and it's available for both Windows and Linux. If you're a Mac user, sorry. You could run one of those in a virtual machine or you know, 
I have run the Windows version from Linux using Wine, and that works fine as well. So sometimes I'll, I'll run both on my machine. All right, anyone else? Last call for questions. All right, well, thanks. And if you have any questions, you can always, you know, ask me, email me, whatever. So thanks a lot. Thank you.